Okay, uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will give you a very simple introduction to ordinary differential equation and its application in the field of biology. So, uh, to start with, I will just give you a simple definition of ordinary differential equation, or ODE. So, ODE is the equality involving a function as its derivatives, just in case you haven't heard it in, in your high school. So, you shouldn't take this talk as a, a, a math-focused talk, it's just an introductory. So, what I'm, I'm interested here to tell you is that uh, it's about two questions. So, how to use the ODE to solve a real-world biological problem, and how can we biologists benefit from it? So, for the first question, I would introduce uh, to you the uh, the population growth model raised by Malthus in 1798. So a little bit of background. In, uh, 200 years ago, people were trying to understand how the population growth is governed, how the dynamics is, and what's the upper limit for population growth in a certain country, say. So after years of a study, Malthus came up with a, a, a hypothesis that the rate of population growth in a unit time period uh, is proportional to the population at the beginning of that period. So we can simply convert this sentence into a, a equation like this. So the population at the end of the period minus the population at the beginning and divided by time, according to this hypothesis, should be proportional to the, uh, uh, the population at the beginning of the period with a constant rate of r. So if you recall the definition of derivatives, when this delta t takes an infinite value, which means a very, very, very short period of time, very close to but not equal to zero, this left-hand side part of the equation simply becomes the derivative of population with regard to t. And thus, we can rewrite this equation into a first-order uh, ordinary differential equation. So by solving it, we get a function which governs the dynamics of a population growth. So you might have a problem understanding every detail of this process. Well, then never mind, because I'm pretty sure in a few weeks uh, this will simply become a smoked piece of a cake for all of you. So what I do want you to pay attention to is that there are several key elements that you need to find out before you can convert a real-world biology into ODEs. So here they are. So first, you need, you need to find out your system, the, the, the object you're interested in your study, right? So in this case, it's simple, simply the, uh, the population, the, the growth of population. And then you need a variable, one variable or set of variables that represent the status of the, uh, of the uh, system. So when we're talking about population, we, what we are interested in is how many people are there for a given time point. So that's why we use the, the size, the n, as, as the, the status variable. So finally, the most important step and is, to, is to find an equation that describes the dynamics. That's, that's where the ODEs came into play. So here comes the question, why do we need ordinary differential equation in this case? So in many of the real-world problems, for example, uh, in this case, the population growth, what we're really after is a function that expresses the, the status of the system as a function of time, t, right? However, in most of the cases, we don't know this function in the first place. That's the problem. And it will be extremely difficult for us to find it directly. So what we can do here is to make one step backward, trying to find a relationship between the status variable and its derivative, and that's ODE. And by solving this ODE, we get the function that we, we have been asking for the uh, in the very beginning of, uh, of the question. So that, that's the rationale to have ODE in your model, in, in your biological model. So, so far we've been talking about uh, uh, how to convert biological problem into ODE. Now we, I want to tell you something about the application. So the first application of ODE here is to make predictions. So let's continue with the population growth model. And I try to predict the, the population in the, in the United States between the year 1790 to 1990 using two different population growth models. Uh, this one in the, in the left panel, as you can see, is the one I just showed you. It's called the exponential growth model. And the one on the right is the logistic growth model. So 
let's, give, uh, let, let, let's put aside the math part, just to show you the, po the, the predictions made by the, these two models and fitted it to the real population, the, the actual population that uh, quantified in uh, between, between the, the uh, 200 years time. So in the left panel, what you can see here is for the first 20 years, the exponential growth model predict nicely the actual population in that country. But after that, the predicted value and the actual population start to deviate. Whereas in the right panel, you can see the logistic growth model just fit nicely to the actual population. So why this logistic mo growth model gives a better prediction, as you can all see here. So if you, if you take a closer look of these two equations here, you can see in the logistic growth model, the proportional, the, the hypothesis of pro proportional growth is somehow retained. However, people introduce a new term. So basically, it's, it's this n max here. So this n max stands for the upper limit, the maximum population that ever be reached in a certain country or a, a region. So the rationale to have this n max in the equation is that to, to have a population survive in that country or a, a certain landmass, people need to be provided with a certain kind of resources. For example, the food, the fuels, everything. And for a given country, in the, in the fixed time period, these resources are always limited. That being said, so with, with the population growth larger and larger, the abundance of these resources will simply decline, right? So the, decre uh, the decrease of resources will in turn have a negative effects on the population growth. Is that understandable? So, so that's exactly what this logistic growth model is trying to cope with here. So I'm not going, detail, going into detail about the, the math part, but I'm just telling you that uh, when, when we apply new biology, new knowledge about biology into your ODE model, you can actually improve the, the predictive power. So in other words, the predictive power of your ODE is only depends on, on the, the underlying biology based on which you write out the equations. So this is a very important point that you all should bear in mind in your future study. Uh, then I want to talk the second major application of ODE, so it's a simulation of the dynamics of the system. Again, I would introduce another model, which is called uh, predator and prey model, or lotka volterra equations. So in this model, we're trying to look at a, a, a system of two populations, the predator population and the prey population, represented by lynx and hares, respectively. Um, so people quantified, measured the population of these two species somewhere in the UK between the year 1850 to 1930s. And what you can see here is there is kind of, I don't know if the color is distinguishable, but you can see here there is a periodic fluctuation in both population and they, they seem to be coupled with each other, right? So it's not that difficult to understand. When there is a lot of hares in the, in the forest, it's easier for the, for, the, for the lynx to get food, right? So th the, when the hares population starts to, to increase, the, the lynx population will start in, increase as well. But with the increasing number of predators presented in the system, that more and more lynx there, and the, that means more hares will be hunted, will be taken out, right? So the hares population will start to decrease. And that also means it will be become increasingly difficult for the lynx to get food because there are simply fewer hares in the, in, the, in the system. So the lynx population will start to decrease, to drop. And then with less and less lynx in the forest, it becomes easier for the hares to, to breed. And then they, they simply have a better survival rate and then they, there is increasing population of hares. So that's exactly what these curves telling us. So instead of looking at the, the real population, the, 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 the actual population in the nature, what we, an, alternative, uh, an alternative way of looking at this is by setting up these two equations. So basically they are exactly, the, they, they are derived from the exponential gro growth model, except that people introduced uh, two new terms to represent the interaction between the two populations. So for example, if here 
uh, the, the, the for the population of the prey, right, there is a negative effect from the number of predators. And for the number of predators, there is a positive effect from the prey. So that's exactly what we've been explaining with these figures, these curves. And by solving these equations, we can eventually reproduce this stable oscillation, this, uh, this periodic change in the population of the two species. So that's why we can use ODE to simulate what is happening, really taking place in the wild, in the nature. So you might say that this is still not that big advantage because with the technology available today, we can still track down these uh, species, two species in the forest. And you're right. But the thing is, when we try, to, biologists trying to understand a system of, of, of more population, say a food web that involves dozens of or hundreds of different species from as small as bacteria to as big as an elephant. That would be really difficult for us to just to quantify the number of, of animals at the same time. But this is still not the worst case. So you might have seen this fig, I don't know. This represents the interaction between 25,000 proteins in human cells. So just, just imagine that you have to quantify the, the concentration of that many molecules from millions of tiny cells. That that's will be decades of work. So by the help of, of these, those simple equations I just showed you, we, we might be able to understand this super complex biological process and, and learn the dynamics and trying to, to understand the human disease and trying to find a better medicine. So this will be a huge advantage. Uh, I think I'm running out of my time, but I still I would like to well, I will want you to know that even with those simple models, we can still, there is still a lot of uh, fields in, in the biological study that these functions can just contribute positively. So, for example, the population model can be used in study of metabolism, fermentation, tumor growth, uh, cell cultivation, transcription regulation, and the predator-prey model can be used in study of the immune system, epidemiology, protein-protein interaction, and signal transduction. And some fields even I don't know. But to summarize the talk today, so I want you to take home three messages. First, ODE is really a powerful tool. And second, the predictive power of your ODE model comes from the, uh, the underlying biology based on which you, you set up the model. And finally, ODE provides an alternative way to expand our understanding of biology. So that's why it's important for you future biologists to, to, to learn and use this this useful tool. And uh, yes, that's probably very much I want to say. Thanks. <laughs>